I wanted to share with you, if the ushers are coming, you're going to receive the tithes and offerings. I, I wanted to share with you uh, the faithfulness of God. Ushers, go ahead. Uh, our book, Satan's Dirty Little Secret, what many people don't realize is, because when you hear about books, you hear about, you know, these few rare, rare books that sell a million copies or a couple million copies. That's very, very rare, especially in the Christian community. They say that a book, a Christian book that sells 5,000 is considered sexful, successful. 10,000 is a really good Christian book. Well, Satan's Dirty Little Secret had already sold when we were co-publishing with Creation House, had already sold about 50,000 copies. But then it got re-released. Charisma, which is the main publisher, they took it on and we re-released it in January. And from January, the first six months of this year has sold an additional 40,000 copies. Isn't that amazing? And now this week, I just sent off the contract and uh, where they're, they're publishing uh, my, a second book of mine, A Place Called Grace. We've also signed the contract that they, uh, they, they, they want to pick up the next two books I write. Now, this is cool. Hey, I'm happy. I don't know about y'all. So God is just uh, doing great things around the world. Amen. And great things through this ministry and great things through your lives. Father, we give you praise and glory. How many of you want to get in the word? Come on, lift your hands up and say, Lord, anoint my mind anoint my spirit to receive of your word right now in Jesus name amen give the Lord one more hand of praise I want to take us very deep in the spirit this morning as I begin a brand new series called going to the glory oh you'll, you'll shout a whole lot better when I explain to you what it is but Going to the glory. I want to put this deep in your spirit. God never intended for the church to operate without his glory. Let me try that over here. God never intended for his church to operate without his glory. There is a... Man, end time manifestation of God. There is a dividing line that is coming into the body of Christ where it's going to be very easy to see the difference between those who are radically going after God and the wishy-washy churchgoers. It's going to become a very distinct line. It will become very clear between those who are truly followers of Christ and those who simply say, I'm a Christian. So much so that many that now declare themselves to be Christians will be so offended by the radicalness of the real followers of Christ that they will stop calling themselves a Christian. And they will simply say, I'm a believer in God. You mark these words, I tell you in the name of Jesus, the day is coming in parts of America very strongly where it will be politically incorrect to call yourself a Christian. Shh, boy, it's quiet now. We are in the midst of an end time battle for the heart and soul of mankind. We are in the midst of an end time battle, but in the midst of this, although we're going to see darkness rise, and how many know it's rising? How many know there's so much hate and venom out there? So much division and strife. Come on, amen. You can't even hardly have a rational conversation anymore. Boy, it's quiet now. I, 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 I put a post on Facebook. I rarely do that. Shouldn't have done it. I put a post on Facebook, and really what I was describing was what happened. Listen, this was telling. This was telling. This week, something happened at the Democratic Convention that shocked most of us when they had removed all references to God and that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel from their party platform. Well, there are forces that were trying to get that out. How many know there are forces in both parties trying to get God out? Okay. 
Let's not be, this is the devil trying to get God out, all right? And he'll, 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 he'll use anybody available. So anyways, they had on Tuesday, I don't know how many of you saw this, or it was on or Tuesday, they voted that in. On Wednesday, there was such a political storm and such an uprising. They were like, oh, okay, we cannot, we got to put God back in and we got to put Jerusalem back in, okay? So they came up before the party leaders came up to do a vote. Now, in order to amend it, they had to have a two-thirds majority. They got up there to do the, the, um, uh, the voice, voice vote, and it was clearly 50-50. Well, the mayor of Los Angeles, he, was, he, he, he seemed very uncomfortable because he was ready to start declaring that it passed, but he knew in his heart it didn't pass. And so he said, wait a minute, let me do that again. <laughs> If you, want, if you want to put in, say yay, yay. If you want to keep it out, keep God out, say, he didn't say keep God out, but that was what it was. Say no, no. And it was like more no's than yes this time. So then he's sitting there going, well, what do I do? Now, here's an interesting thing. Here's, uh, I hope I'm not losing power. Anyways, here's an interesting, uh, the, the demons kind of ran through the sound system. <laughs> So, so he knows that there was a problem, all right? So then, I'm, and I'm watching this, and I'm watching people say, no. They're, they're like, no, we don't want God in the platform. I'm like, really? And it's like half of them. Half of them are passionate, yes. Half are passionate, no. Then I saw a picture. He did it a third time. I'll tell you that in a moment. But I saw a picture of the teleprompter, because they all have teleprompters. Big old teleprompter. The teleprompter, which is pre-written out, said... It is in, in the opinion of the chair, two-thirds having voted in the affirmative, the measure is passed. And I said, wait a minute. They told him to tell the measure had passed before they even voted on the measure getting passed. So no wonder he was struggling because he's trying to, he's supposed to read this thing and he's like going, but it ain't true. And then this woman walks up to him and you're going to explain why I say this. This white woman, I'm going to explain why I'm saying that. Walked up to him and said, you just have to make a ruling. Well, what ruling? The ruling that's on that, that teleprompter. And then she said, and let them do whatever they're going to do. That's not democracy. That's the dictatorship. So he went and called for a third vote, and she kind of got this look like, all right, whatever. Ha ha. We know what's going to happen. Again, 50-50, the measure did not pass. But he went ahead and said, well, two-thirds, he read what it was on there, two-thirds, and they passed the measure and put it back in. Three times they had a chance to affirm God. Three times they denied God. So anyways, I put a picture of this up on Facebook of that teleprompter saying, man, these people lied. They know, they know, they pre-planned it. They lied, okay? I call on anybody that's going to lie, all right? All right? And I said the Democratic Party. And I, I want to say this because I want you to understand what the spirit that's out there right now, all right? I just want to tell you. So I put out there and I said, this is what the Democrats did and the Democrats lied. Now, please understand me. It was a Hispanic man that was leading the chairman, that was leading the vote. The cameras only ever showed white people booing God because that's what happened when the vote was passed. They were booing God. And it was a white woman that told this man to go ahead and rule incorrectly. So I put that up there, and I get a preacher, an African-American preacher, goes on my Facebook and calls me a racist. Please explain that to me. How am I a racist? The president wasn't even in there. I never used his name. I wasn't blaming him. Come on, y'all hearing me? Now, the reason you say, well, why do you bring, and I, I deleted all that garbage off. You say, why did, why did you even bring, why do you even bring that up? Because I'm telling you, there's such a spirit out there that's trying to pit brother. This is a fellow minister. This is a fellow minister. Brother against brother and church against church. My Lord, no. Let's stop the false accusations. And we got to get back to the glory of God. Hey. Somebody say, let's go to the glory. Say it again. Say, let's go to the glory. Sunday. Hey. 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 
That's about as dumb as me saying, you know what? <laughs> that's, that's like, <laughs> Lord, gee, I won't go there. I won't go there. It's like me saying that some woman did something wrong against God and saying, oh, he's a sexist. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Someone said the devil's a liar. Because we're going to break these things. Why? The only choice, the only hope we have is not a political party, but it's the glory of God. We got to get the glory. Someone say we're going to the glory. We need the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. I love this. I love this. I love this. Hallelujah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. <laughs> the train of his robe filled the temple. I want to just put this in your spirit. Get ready. God's about to open the eyes of his church like never before to see the Lord as he really is, high and lifted up. Someone say, high and lifted up. Shoo! My God, I... Shoo! I'm having some overflow from that prophetic last night. I'm seeing stuff in the spirit. Nekaramashande. God's about to turn some things around. Holy Ghost is about to start invading some churches that didn't even expect him to invade. You're about to see explosions of revelation and manifestation of God. Woo! Yes, Lord. He's about to start invading some of the churches that we spirit-filled people wrote off as the dead and the dry and the has-been and the yesterday churches. He's about to go into those churches and breathe fire into some of the old line denominations, the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Baptists, Anglicans, Lutherans. Hey! Shikara Masande. Shikara Masande. Shikaram. <laughs> He's a, I'm telling you, I know the Spirit of God saying I, a bunch of the Pentecostal Spirit-filled churches have walked away from my power, so I'm about to give it to those who never were even seeking it to stir them up. <laughs> you know God does that? God will touch one group to stir up the jealousy of another. Because God was never interested in, us, interested in us in just having church and just being nothing more than a Christian social club. Huh? He was not at all interested about us having all the finest, finest and fanciest stuff and $100,000 chandeliers and, and, you know, practically tuned Disney in the children's department. Come on, come on, come on. All the creature comforts where you could just come in and come out. He wanted the manifestation and demonstration of his power and of his glory. Because it's the only hope for a lost and dying world. We're losing a generation. I said we're losing a generation. They're walking away from God. I got a, a message from a young man that used to come to this church for a few weeks. He came and I really had a heart for him and then he just disappeared. I haven't seen him for a couple years. He, he, he messages me and tells me the reason he's not going to church is he's an atheist. I said, no, you're not. I said, there's no such thing as an atheist. According to the book of Romans, everyone knows. Everyone has an awareness of God. Science has even proven it. They did. They, they did a study with the top atheists of the National Atheist Association, and they put them up to lie detector tests, and they asked them all these questions, and they, one of the questions they asked, they said, do you believe there is a God? Every one of them said no. Every one of them showed they were lying. <laughs> they know God's real. Come on. I don't care if they say, I don't believe in God. Yes, you do. Let me pray for you. Shakara Moshende. Yes, 
the glory of God. I saw the Lord. I got so many scriptures to get to, and I can't even get past the first verse. What happened when Moses saw the Lord? His face was radiant. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. There was a visible manifestation of light that came forth from him. Listen, when I'm talking about going to the glory, I'm not talking about goosebumps. I'm not talking about a jerk and a jiggle and a dance and a wiggle. Come on, I like my goosebumps. <laughs> And I love to shout with the next, with, uh, as much with the next of them. But I'm talking about something that produces such a dramatic transformation in our lives that there is a visible, tangible change. Yeah. Yeah. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Oh, Jesus, help me, help me, help me. Somebody say we're going to the glory. Shh. You're going to get some revelation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't like this, do you? Psalm 34. Whew. Verse 5. Watch this. Psalm 34, verse 5. They looked to him and were radiant. And their faces were not ashamed. They looked to him and became radiant. Come on, have you ever been around somebody? I've seen this. Have you ever been around somebody? They had just spent an incredible time in the presence of God, seeking the face of God, and you sit there and say, man, you're like glowing. Come on, I'm telling you, I watch some people come out of these altar calls and out of these meetings. They had a young man visiting us last night. Man, he got so radically blasted and touched. He stood up. I, I tell you, he looked like he swallowed a light bulb. But that's about to get stronger. Why do you think they had pictures, ancient pictures of saints with halos around them? What was the halo? That was a painting picturing something they saw. Come on, we got to raise the level of our belief. You say, well, I'm never, I, I'm not, we don't see that here in America. Not yet. But it's coming. God hasn't given up on America. There is a move of God coming to parts of America that are greater than anything we've ever seen before. Huh. I saw the Lord above it. Whoo, high and lifted up. Somebody say high and lift it up. It's time we stop demanding God come to where we are and it's time we begin to go to where he is. It's time we stop bringing God down to man's, our concept, and just trying to make Jesus a good, kind, generous person. And we begin to recognize him that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every word that comes out of his mouth is absolute. Ooh when you see him, it's going to mess with you. You're not going to walk up and begin to see God, see the glory of God, and sit there and go, ah, isn't he lovely? <laughs> Come on, nowhere in the Bible did that ever happen. Come on, when they saw God in the Bible, they fell to the ground as though dead. They cried out, get away from me, I'm a sinner. Isaiah says, whoa. No, 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 no. He didn't say whoa. He said whoa, but not whoa the way we think whoa is. <laughs> whoa, there is this word of judgment. Whoa unto me. Judgment unto me. I am undone. I think some of the church needs to get undone. I am undone. Huh? For I'm a man of unclean lips amongst the people of unclean lips. I saw the Lord and I am exposed. See, when, I, whew, <laughs> when you see the Lord, you're going to cry out, Holy, holy, holy. 
That's why I want to say to you right now that anybody declares and claims to you that they've been having heavenly encounters and they've seen God and they've seen the glory of God and they live an unholy life is a liar. They might be able to put on a good preacher, tell a good story, but you can't see the glory of God and then walk out and commit adultery. Oh. Someone say the devil's a liar. Come on, how many of you want the glory? Do you really want the glory? People die in the glory. Now don't get too freaked out and run out. There is a thing called the blood of Jesus. Just make sure you're under it. <laughs> We're going to the glory. Someone say, I'm going to the glory. And when we see the glory, when we repent, when we cry out to God, he will take fire from the altar and he will purge us of our sin. Mm -mm. Why do we need to see the glory? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, from the Amplified. I'm going to read it right now. And all of us, as with an unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are constantly being transfigured into His very own image. In ever-increasing splendor, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. As we continue to behold in His glory, we're being changed into His image. Well, no wonder so much of the church is having so much hard time becoming like Jesus because we're not seeing enough of Jesus. That's why legalism never works. Hey, we can sit there and tell you, do this, do this, do this, do this, but that doesn't change your nature. But when you see him, then you become like him, then you'll do what he does. The problem isn't that there's too much sin in the world. The problem is there's too little Jesus revealed. I don't need man's opinion about God anymore. I need a revelation of God. Come on. We don't need to keep going. We don't need to keep going and hearing more sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon, which is nothing more than a bunch of psychological babble and Christianese and Christian psychology in the sense of, of or Christianized psychology, in the sense of just this nice thing and that thing, we need to have an encounter with the glory of God. One touch, one, one time you see the glory, it'll change everything. Shh. Somebody say, Lord, show me your glory. Say it again. Say, Lord, show me your glory. Oh, help me, Lord. <sighs> As we see His glory, we're going to be changed and transformed in His image. 1 John 3, 2 says this. He says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Say it after me. When I see Him, when I, see him I shall be like Him. God never intended for his church to operate without his glory. God never intended for you to try to become like him by yourself. This is good news for a few of you. For all of you that have arrived, you can ignore the rest of the message. But for the few of us that are still being changed... I want to put something very deep in your spirit here this morning. God never intended for you to struggle. I know some of you now hiding under your denominational, doctrinal, 
cloaks. God never intended for you to struggle. He does not get glory when you struggle. Because he never looked to man's efforts to bring about his purposes. Come on. You are saved by grace. And that word saved there doesn't mean just born again. It means to be made whole, spirit, soul, and body. You are saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why you never are right to go around and say, Ooh, I'm a man, a woman of God of prayer. I, got, I just pray, 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 pray. But you need to be like me and pray. You know what? You couldn't pray like that except God had put it on you. Come on. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Shh. Um, huh? Huh? Come on, people walking around like, oh, see, that's why people would come to me and they'd sit there and say, oh, Pastor Steve, man, you're such a mighty man of God. I'm sitting there going, no, you don't know, understand who I was. Don't look at me. And, then, and that's when I first got saved and I, I had these incredible encounters with the glory of God. So it was changing my life. And then I was living just radical life for God. And they're like, man, you know, that's just, well, that's just Brother Steve. That's just the way he is. That's just, that's just him. No, it was never me. I had an encounter with the glory and it changed me. And I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, we've got to go deeper. And I'm, 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 you say, why are you starting this message? Because God is bent and determined over these next few weeks as we take in to walk you step by step. How to get to the glory. Hear me, hear me, hear me. God is not calling you to go to the glory and not show and, and hid from us how to get there. He made a plan. He made a process. He said, this is the way how you get to my glory. I'm going to show you how to get there. We haven't got there because of ignorance. We haven't got there because no one taught us how to get there. But it's in the word. Someone say, I want the glory. Want the glory. Say it again. Say, I want, the glory. I want the glory. Now, let me put it deep in your spirit. Oh, my Father God. Shh. Maybe I'll get to the first little part. In the Old Testament, where did the glory reside? Somebody shout at me. The tabernacle. Over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Above the mercy seat. In the holy of holies. And in the tabernacle, you had the holy of holies. Room about 15 feet by 15 by 15. Then you had another room called the holy place. A room about 15 by 15 by 30, approximately. In that room was the altar of incense. Table of showbread. The candlestick. Outside of that, was the brazen laver where they washed their hands and their feet. Before that was the brazen altar where the sacrifices took place. And then there was the gate at the tent doors to enter in. And in this picture, in this example that God laid down for us in the tabernacle, he was revealing the process of how to get to the glory. Because if you wanted to get through the glory, you had to enter the gates. You had to do something at the brazen altar. Then you had to go by. You couldn't skip a stage. You had to go to the brazen laver. Then you had to get to the altar of incense and the table of showbread and the, and the candlestick. And then you had to pass through the veil and go to the Ark of the Covenant where there was the mercy seat. And only then could you see the glory of God. 
And the Bible says that everything in the Old Testament was given us to us as an example to teach to us. There is patterns and principles that God is saying, I'm going to show you how to get from the outside to the inside. I don't want to be in the outer court any longer. I don't want to be peering in, wondering what's happening. I want to get past the gate and past the altar and past the labor and past the holy place. I want to get to the holy of holies and see the glory of God. And it's what Jesus has opened for us. For only the high priest could go in there and only once a year. But when Jesus died upon the cross and the earth shook, the, the Bible says that the tent, the, the curtain was ripped in two. What was God saying? I'm taking away the wall of separation. All ye that are hungry, all ye that are burdened, all ye that come on, come on in, come to my glory. Huh? Shakara my Sunday. I'm talking about the visible, tangible manifestation of all that God is and all that God has. That's what the what bring that board up here quickly, quickly, quickly. That's what the word glory means. It's the Greek word doxa. It's not a feeling. It's not a goose pump. We've made false finish lines for too many years. We said, oh, the glory's here when we had a good emotional feeling. No, when the glory shows up, you're not going to have to announce that the glory showed up. Hala Moshande. Huh? Come on. The doxa. Every say doxa. It's all that God is and all that God has. Not just everything that God has, but everything that God is. And God's whole plan and purpose, the entire mystery of the gospel was to restore the glory. Amen. The mystery of the gospel is this. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where was the glory? It was in the temple. And the New Testament says, know ye not that you, my God, my God, are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're going to start walking out and beams of light are going to be shooting out of you. Glory to God. Somebody say, all that God is. Say, all that God has. How in the world are you ever going to suffer defeat when everything that God is is on you and everything that God has is in you? Come on, you tell me what devil, you tell me what demon, you tell me what circumstance can possibly hold you down for one moment, my brother, my sister, when you're walking in the manifestation of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I know about this preacher up here. I'm tired of normal, typical church where you go in and you go out and you hear the same old dry sermons year in and year out. I don't want another sermon. I want an encounter with the manifestation of the invisible God. Oh, Karamo We don't need more debates. We don't need more forums. We need the glory. I said we need the glory. And we need to not stop till we get it. You say, that's been a little bold talking. Well, I, re I, I, have, I have a bold Bible to back me up. He said, if anyone asks me anything, 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 anything you desire in my name, I will do it. Well, Jesus, I ask in your name, show us the glory. Huh? We're too busy trying to pray for our next car payment. Huh? We're too wrapped up trying to take care of this little thing here and this little thing there. But if you get your eyes off your circumstances and get your eyes on the glory of God, you're never going to have to worry about those things. For my God shall supply all your needs. Seek ye first the kingdom. And all these things will be added. The devil keeps distracting us. Come on, he keeps distracting us. 
all these circumstances. You know what I'm talking about. No sooner do you walk out having a counter with God than the phone starts ringing. Some relative started flipping out. Some bill came in you didn't expect. Some person's having a, having a breakdown and it tries to distract you and distract you and distract you. And even all this stuff going on, I keep having to fight it. All this stuff going on in the political realm. I, I'm praying about it and I'm going into spiritual warfare because that's what I can do. But I'm not, but I keep saying, but you know what? Despite how concerned I am about it, I'm not going to let that stuff keep me from going hardcore right now after the glory. It's all that God is and all that God has. We got to get to the glory. I said, we got to get to the glory. I said, we got to get to the glory. Someone said the devil's a liar. Say it again. Say the devil's a liar. Something's got to happen to us. Something's got to happen to us. Something's got to happen to us. We got to begin down this process. We got to enter his gates. You can't even get into the glory unless you get past the gate. And the Bible tells us how to get past the gate. You enter his gates with. Oop, there it is. With. Well, no wonder most of the Christians are out in the outer court. No wonder they're way out there in the wilderness somewhere. Because almost their time is complain, complain, murmur, murmur, gripe, gripe. Oh, I'm in trouble now. Some of y'all just, some of y'all, come on, just turn to your neighbor and say, you're not doing that, are you? I'm going to enter. I want to get to the glory. I got to start with some thanksgiving. God is drawn to a grateful heart. I'm grateful for everything I got. And even I ain't got nothing. I'm grateful that he loves me. You see the strategy of the devil? He throws all those little circumstances to get us complaining and going, well, I just don't know why. Why doesn't God this? And why doesn't God that? Uh Uh-oh, some of y'all hearing your own voice. Murmur and complain and this. Well, I'm trusting God, but, well, all of a sudden you put the button there, you ain't trusting God. No, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I was writing a chapter on my grace book on this, on being thankful and entering and, 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 and the, 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 how powerful it was. And this was about seven years ago. It was about, oh, 11.30 at night or 10.30 or something like that. Benjamin was supposed to be in bed an hour and a half earlier. And he came into my office. I was writing, literally at the moment, writing on this chapter on thankfulness. And he came into my office. And he said, I said, bud, what are you doing up? He said, well, Dad, I've been thinking. Now, we have a little joke around my house. When Benjamin is thinking, it costs me money. And so I looked to him to say something, and he said, and no, it's not going to cost you any money. (laughs) He said, I just want to thank you and mom for all that you have done for me. And it was just past his birthday, and he had about $50 that came in for birthday. And he took $25 out, and he handed it to me, and I want to give this to you. And I'm sitting there going, no. But I love my boy. We raised him up right. And he says, and you have to receive it. Don't rob me of my blessing. (laughs) The emotions that were flooding through me were so strong, overwhelmed. And I hugged him. I loved him. I sent him off back to his room. I walked into another room, and I sat there, and I just began to cry. Such tears of joy 
so overwhelmed, so touched. I wanted to just run back into the room, wake him up and say, let's go to Walmart. It's shopping spree time. <laughs> Come on, can you relate, parents? Come on, amen. Your 13-year-old walks up and gives half his money to you just, to, just because he wants to be great. He's showing his gratitude. I wanted to open up at my treasuries and buy him anything he wanted. And as soon as I said, and I, that's what I was thinking, Lord, I think I'm going to go wake him up and I got to tell you, I got to do something for him. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, that's, you're only feeling a little bit of what I feel every time my people are grateful to me. He says, when my people come thanking me, I want to open up the treasures of heaven. <laughs> Woo. We enter. Someone say, I enter. Yes. Say it again. Say, I enter. Yes. His gates yes. with thanksgiving. Yes. That's why the Bible says to be, oh, yeah, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, glory to God. I'm going to come in for a landing in a th few hours. No, 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 no. In just a few moments. Yeah, can you give me another minute or two? Who will give me another, like, two minutes? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. 18. All right, I got plenty of time. That only works about once every six months. Oh, Ephesians, Robert, if you'll come. Ephesians, or oh, the worship team come. Ephesians chapter 5, watch this. Woo. Verse 15. Ephesians chapter, chapter uh, 5, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Do not, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled. Oh, someone say be filled. Be just, just the musicians, not the singers right now. Thank you. Say be filled. Be filled. <laughs> There's no excuse. Be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks. Always. Ever say always. For all things. What? For all things? Well, excuse me, Lord. We have to have a discussion here. Because there's some stuff in my life I am, circumstance I'm not thankful for. Why? All things work together for good. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. I'm thankful, God. I remember. Year 2000, we went through a financial devastation. Everything collapsed. We were horribly in debt. It was not because we lived a lavish lifestyle, but mainly we were trying to help God out. We kept paying for things in our name for the ministry. Year after year, that built. Got crushing. And we went through a very difficult circumstance in our church. The income dropped dramatically. And everything collapsed on us. I had to go through a lot of breaking. God smacked me upside my head. Dealt with me strongly about my debt mindset. Ran us through the ringer. Had to face creditors calling and threatening to take my children's toys from in front of them and telling my kids that they got a deadbeat dad. That's what they, the bill collectors were saying to me. Some of you know what I'm talking about. As a parent, as a father, and you're sitting there crying, God, what have I done? I've sold my family into slavery. We went through a legal process and it was it was violating you're not talking to a guy who hasn't gone through some stuff 
I affectionately call it the year of hell. And I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Because God did something in me. He turned all things out for good. Now we live and have lived for 10 years now. Well, for not, uh, nine years now, 100% debt free. Our home is paid for. Everything's paid for cash. There's no debt of any. Hallelujah. I'm so much more blessed now. But I had to go through something. Come on, amen. Some of you are going through some stuff. Some of it's because of some stuff you sowed. Come on, amen. But he still loves you. And he's still going to work it out. He's still going to turn it around. If you'll humble yourself, if you'll listen to him, come on, amen. If you'll let him get rid of the wrong thinking and put in the right thinking. Because, see, I asked him. I said, Lord, why didn't you just come and deliver us? You get drunk, you know, $120,000 in unsecured credit. You could just, God, you're God, $120,000. Rain down a few gold bars instead of manna. That's no problem. And you know what the Lord spoke to me? He said, son, if I would have just paid it off in a few years, you would have been millions of dollars in debt. Because your problem wasn't a lack of money. Your problem was your wrong thinking. But all the way through it, as tough as it was, I thank you, God. I would wake up each morning having nothing. And I would say, today, I thank you, God. Today, I'm okay. Today, I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord. I thank you that you love me enough that you discipline me. I thank you that you're taking me through. <laughs> I thank you that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I thank you that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I thank you you'll never leave me nor forsake me even when I mess it up. I thank you that your mercy endures forever and ever and ever and ever. I thank you that your angels are given charge over me. I thank you that your glory is my rear guard. 